Ina Long. I am the Strategic Director of Networked, and it's a pleasure to be able to have you all here as we dive into an all-important conversation on diversity, equity, and inclusion. We're going to take just a few more minutes to allow people to get in and get settled, but as you can see, our room is filling up. We have such a wonderful group that we bring together and really dive into various topics that boldly solve community challenges. So we appreciate you taking just a moment of your afternoon to be here with us today. As you all know, we do record the convening so that they are available as well to those who may not be able to participate and attend. Before we get going, I'm going to, I'm going to ask, I'm going to need a brave voice. Um, we always talk about or begin on a high note with a celebration. So as we think about entering into the new year, January, and what we are working on as organizations looking ahead, is there anyone who would be bold enough to be an awesome voice to share a very quick celebration in your organizations while we get everyone in and settled? Any celebration, any update that you all wish to share that is worth celebrating to kick us off today? Any celebrations? I need somebody else to help me co MC this. Come on, we need another voice. We know what Network is about. It's about community, it's about connections. It's not just about sitting and listening. We got to engage and we got to participate. So, who has a celebration? Hi, this is Jonathan Clayton from the Kansas Department of Commerce. And my celebration right now is that we are seeing probably the best responses. Of uh, the public interest and government interest statewide in our base grant program. Um, it's for building a stronger economy and it's really geared towards business development, business parks, industrial parks, and we have had a very strong response to the program so far. So very happy about that. That is fantastic to hear. I appreciate you sharing that with us. Will you do uh, me a favor and in the chat, just put a link to that resource that you've uh, shared so that we can definitely reference that as well. Fantastic. And with that, I'm going to hand the co-hosting uh, duties off to Tiffany as we prepare to get into our content presentation today. I'll go ahead and pull up the presentation deck that will anchor us in our discussion. As always, if you all have reactions, please share them. If you have a question or an aha that comes up out of this conversation, then please take a moment to share that as well. We invite open uh, dialogue as we begin to dive into this session. And just a reminder, if you are not speaking, please go ahead and put yourself on mute so we're not picking up background. I love my voice, but not the echo. So. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Special thanks to our networked partnership for community investment supporters and our sponsors, Network Kansas, E2 Entrepreneurial Ecosystems, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Kansas and the Kansas Health Foundation. Now, as we think about network and what we are doing here for this convening, and this topic, we're really looking at as an organization, as a framework, connecting unconnected networks and closing gaps between people, information, and assets to develop pathways that boldly solve community challenges. Again, we are about highlighting resources, highlighting information that people on these calls can go back and take into their communities to actually activate. And we know it's possible because these resources exist and they are being activated in various ways. We just need to be plugged into the information. So that is what Networked is about. As we dive into today's topic, I do want to share um, a couple of things to consider. I do have a graphic design and community uh, communication services company that does DEI consulting. And there are some ground rules or some DEI principles of my practice that I want to share with you all and network as we begin to dive into this topic of enhancing diversity, equity, and inclusion within our organizations. We know that DEI is a very broad topic. It's a topic that many organizations are really looking at and really diving into how do they make changes in these areas. Well, for us, we set the principles and the ground rules around this. Number one, listen to understand. Listen to understand, not to react, not to respond, but listen truly to understand. We're going to assume positive intentions, and we're also going to extend grace. In this area, sometimes there's a lot of unknowns. We don't necessarily know how to word things. We don't necessarily understand how maybe there's some learning or some clarifications that we need around different components of DEI. We want to just set it out front 
We are assuming positive intentions, no harm done, just learning. If there is something that's said that does provide or produce a trigger, lean into that trigger. Ask yourself as you're listening, why? Why do I feel this way? And that, and explore that trigger because the more that we understand ourselves in DEI, the more comfortable we can be when it comes to exploring and navigating the space. We want to operate with clear intentions. Today is about learning and getting information, sharing practices one to another, and hearing from our Empower Advisory Board members as we look to truly enhance our organizations around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then also, we can talk all day, but we know we have to activate this learning. And particularly around diversity, equity, and inclusion, sometimes it's comfortable just to sit in the talk space, the talking phase around DEI. We've got to activate what we're learning. We've got to do the work. Agreed? Agreed. Let's continue to move forward as to why Network Kansas is jumping into diversity, equity, and inclusion work. And from the latest annual report that Network Kansas is just releasing, we're getting it out into the atmosphere, it's looking at the shift. There's a shift in intentions, services, and vision casting here with Network Kansas as the organization works to invest locally, partner broadly, and impact deeply. And I'm going to pass the virtual mic now to Steve Radley, CEO of Network Kansas, to share more about why Network Kansas has prioritized diversity, equity, and inclusion. Steve. Thank you, Christina. Well, thank you for uh, coming uh, to be with us today. Um, Eric and I, uh, myself and Imogene were fortunate enough to start participating in a uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion program uh, sponsored by the Kauffman Foundation. And as we began working and diving into this, we realized that we had a long way to go, both externally and internally. And so uh, um, we began with this advisory board and we have had some unbelievable conversations uh, around specific topics, specific implementations, and we continue to learn. And uh, what we're finding is as we learn, others really want to learn too. And so that's why we wanted to have this time together to talk about this. Thank you so much for setting that atmosphere, Steve. And just a reminder, as well as we continue to move forward in our agenda, if you are able to share your video, please do so, so we can see reactions and things of that nature as well. We wanna to talk to people, not just necessarily names. We understand if you're not in an opportunity to do so, but we encourage and invite those who are to do. All right, so now helping to go further in setting the context before we dive into our discussion with our Empower Advisory Board members is Dr. Robert Weems, Jr. Dr. Weems is the Willard W. Garvey Distinguished Professor of Business History at Wichita State University. He's also a Network Kansas board member and an Empower Advisory Board member. Dr. Weems is a leading voice on many things diversity, equity, and inclusion related, and it is quite an honor and a privilege to introduce him to some, present him to others, as he talks about why diversity, equity, and inclusion is even important enough to discuss anyway. Dr. Weems. Hey, thank you for that introduction, Christine. I, and I wanna thank everybody for, for coming out to this program today. I wanna to briefly uh, address the question of why is diversity, equity, and inclusion work so important? And as a historian, I wanna briefly address this question in the context of past, present, and future. Now, beginning with the past, long before the terms diversity, equity, and inclusion became a part of our you know, national vocabulary, there were some organizations that realized that including non-white participants on their teams would in fact enhance their operations. And I'm gonna talk about a couple historical phenomena to hopefully better illustrate this point. In the early 20th century, there was a dramatic increase in the number of black social workers in the United States. And there was a specific reason for this perceived need to in fact train more black social workers. Uh, in the early 20th century, we saw a significant number of Black people leave the rural South to move to cities across the country. And there was a belief that the best way to serve these individuals 
would be to enhance the number of black social workers. Again, a very pragmatic response to what was perceived to be a growing national issue. Now in the mid 20th century, we saw a variety of American corporations that came to the conclusion that they needed to in fact hire what was called back in the day, uh, Negro market specialists. Again, I, I mentioned a moment ago that as African-Americans became more entrenched in America's cities, they became more recognized as a consumer market. And again, to reach this increasingly important consumer market, we saw again, major corporations hire what literally represent the black pioneers in corporate America to again, represent their products in the black community. And one of the more interesting instances of this, uh, back in the day, I guess the cola wars between Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola, Pepsi-Cola made a you know, conscious effort to market in the African-American community. And over time, you know, Pepsi pretty much had a, a, a very wide margin in terms of African-Americans drinking that product versus Coca-Cola. Now, moving to the present, hopefully these past examples of what uh, we might call today diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives might help to dispel the notion held by some that DEI initiatives primarily represent some type of social engineering and that they have little in fact to do with an organization's profitability and or slash efficiency. Now also when we look at America in, in 2022, we're talking about a more ethnically diverse society than it was in the 20th century. Also, when we look at America in 19, excuse me, 2022, as compared to the 20th century, we see women of all races employed in leadership capacity to a greater extent than had been in the past. So today, any organization seeking either to market commercial products or provide various services to clients must acknowledge contemporary demographics to accomplish these aims. And again, this has little to do with social engineering or being a do-gooder or, or all this and that. This has everything to do with facing present day reality. Now looking toward the future, uh, according to US Census projections, persons of European descent in the United States may be a numerical minority as early as 2042. Now, needless to say, uh, considering the history of this country, there's some people that view this event with extreme dread and fear. Nevertheless, in the new world that is clearly coming, it is in America's best interests for its non-white citizens to be prepared for the enhanced leadership roles that they'll be called upon to assume. Again, this has nothing to do with social engineering. Now I wanna conclude by explicitly going back to the, the question, why is diversity, equity, and inclusion work so important? And it appears clear that unless the United States consciously seeks to develop the human capital possessed by its non-white and female citizens, America's potential for future growth will be proportionately diminished. Thank you for your time and attention. You know, it's always a pleasure to hear from you, but I have to say to cover so much so powerfully in such short time, thank you for that. Because so often when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, I see some hand claps, yes. So often when we talk about it, it's so broad. And some people don't want to activate in it because they don't know where to start or they feel like it's too broad that it's so overwhelming that they cannot make impact at all. Thank you for your expert framework 
so that we can dive deeply in today's conversation. So with that being said, it is my pleasure to um, introduce members of the Empower Advisory Board. And just as a reminder about just like any other topic that we are looking at, um, discussing and highlighting with Networked real quickly, we want to make sure you're maximizing the experience by keeping it interactive. So as you're listening to today's discussion, contribute what is new learning for your organization through this conversation, or even what is emphasized learning that you can take back and really work on because we know so many are working within diversity, equity, and inclusion. What is one question you have as a result of this presentation? And most importantly, what will you do with this conversation? Helping to discuss and dive deeply into this topic are members of the Empower Advisory Board Network Kansas's national DEI team. We have Sean Brown, who is with the Kansas Health Foundation as a program officer. Sean, thank you so much for joining today. We have got Rhonda Harris. She is the Director of the Office of Minority and Women Business Development with the Kansas Department of Commerce. Rhonda, thank you so much for joining us. We've got one of my favorite people in the whole wide world, Jonathan Long. He is my husband, but he is also uh, the Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the Tulsa Regional Chamber of Commerce. He is also the Executive Director of Mosaic. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. We have got Cora Lopez. She is the director of Main Street, Dodge City, slash Ford County Development Corporation there in Dodge City. Thank you for joining us. We've got David Rickster. He is the CEO and co-founder of M Street X, joining us from Virginia. Thank you for taking the time. You all have heard from Dr. Weems. And then there are members of Network Kansas's uh, staff who also greatly participate in the Empower Advisory Board. I want to thank you all for taking time today to join us and we're gonna jump right in. We're having a facilitated dialogue, kind of virtual panel style with members of our board. And so we will start with Sean and Coral. Uh, Sean, you can take the lead. And I wanna ask you to get going. What are some starting steps for organizations to determine how to approach or strengthen their DEI work? What are some starting steps? say, um, first of all, start with the, the end goal in mind and really ask yourself, you know, what is it your organization wants to accomplish and how will DI help you? Um, think about defining the terms in terms of your vision, um, starting to have internal conversations about what diversity, equity, and inclusion looks like now in your organization and what it might look like in the future. Um, asking yourself key, key uh, questions such as what policies need to change and how do we get there? Uh, what's the current culture? Um, what deep level work needs to happen so that more productive conversations can happen about DEI? And then thinking about just creating those safe spaces within your organization as you go through the process. Um, another critical thing is just finding out where your board stands in terms of DEI and having conversations with them. Um, and so, and then thinking about the makeup of your board um, in terms of diversity of race, thinking, lived experience, gender. Um, and then uh, when, when these DEI um, ideas are being championed, are they being pushed up from the staff or is it top driven and top down um, from your board and leadership and where do they stand? And that will help you to think about what kind of training is needed for both board and staff. And then as you just examine those internal processes, whether it's about staffing, recruitment, vendors, or diversity of thought, pay equity, what's on your website and communication, um, and, and thinking about just how you support uh, individuals of different races and backgrounds and making sure that they're comfortable within the organization. At that point, you're ready to set some strategies around your goals for your um, operations. And so really thinking about your North Star, um, is key. And just as Christina said, give yourself grace. It's a process and it's a long-term commitment. Come on, Ms. Sean Brown, you just did that. <laughs> that was a lot of spaces to begin to begin to really look at and think about, but beginning with that end in mind and truly the commitment of leadership to be able to press forward the message, get alignment, but also the staff has got to buy in as well. Thank you for those various touch points. And I did chat a few for those of you all who um, picked those things up as well. Coral, I'm asking you the same question. What are some starting steps for organizations to determine how to approach or strengthen their DEI work? So I think a, a, a very important piece to, to remember is not just the people that make up the organization, but also who we 
we serve and making sure that DEI extends onto um, that customer base that we have and those, um, those that we serve and who we're there for. Um, as many of you know, part of being in, in Southwest Kansas is um, not just, um, like I said, non-whites, right? So Dodge City being a minority majority community, it's important that we reach out and that we are um, making it available so that people feel comfortable to come out and uh, ask us questions and reach, uh, understand that we're here as a, as, as a connector for them. Absolutely. And Coral, you made a really good comment in one of our um, team meetings as we're looking at diversity around vocabulary as well. You even use the term minority majority. Uh, we've also heard majority minority. However, I was reading through the Kansas Health Foundation had a piece to come out and they actually called the majority demographic, what it is. Instead of using the term majority minority, they used in that particular example, black majority. And so we're noticing some changes in how um, even the vocabulary around DEI is adapting and adjusting. And so being mindful about how your organization is talking and communicating using those vocabulary terms are really important. Thank you for bringing that up in our team meeting and, and sharing what you did today. Yeah, and it's not just about, sorry, and it's not just about making sure that we're addressing things correctly. Like I said, it's about knowing who your targeted audience is and using the vocabulary that they will understand without using those high level words or acronyms that we always use in our everyday. We understand them, but the normal everyday community people might not. That is so true. There's varied reactions to BIPOC, for example. We can have some chat around that in the chat. Thank you, Coral. So then once you understand some of the starting steps, David, Imogene, can you talk about what inside of your organization, um, particularly your organizational culture, needs to be in place when working to strengthen DEI? What needs to be in place when working to strengthen DEI? Sure. So let me just jump in real quickly here. So when we talk about culture, you want to create a culture where everyone feels that they belong. That's number one. So let's expand on that. What does that exactly mean? Um, and there are three key things that we at M Street X are working on currently. Number one is psychological safety. People feel safe to speak and say what they are thinking. And even when it's different from what others are saying. That's number one. Number two, connection. People feel connected to one another. They generally care about each other and their well-being. Number three, appreciation of difference. Individual differences are valued and optimized. Unique skills and strengths are leveraged. That's how you really produce a culture where diversity is key. Thank you for that. Imogene? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, you know, I think what I've been thinking about a lot is having that, We some folks have already talked about language, right? And so this framework of giving folks, empowering them to feel maybe a little more safe, if you will, right? So just kind of knowing where to start, um, and having just a framework to build on, on, on what, what does it all mean? It, it's, it can be really confusing when it's like, do the work, DEI. <laughs> okay. So just building that base, building that infrastructure around what this is, a little bit of the history, where is this coming from? Why are we doing this? How, why do we as an organization feel this is aligned with our, you know, our mission and our value and building from that. Um, and then as David alluded to this, at the same time, how can you be providing a culture or a space, say this is safe, there is grace here, not everything has to be perfect, um, Just we just, but we need to get started. And so how's the space that it's comfortable so folks feel they can get started? That's really critically important when we look at DEI. Again, where's the starting point? How do we create safety within it, knowing that it is about progress, not perfection? 
Um, because as we are ever evolving in this work, in this space, there's gonna be new things to learn. So perfect isn't the measure, it's progress and there's evidence and what happens when you make DEI a personal priority, a professional priority, and then what that business impact is because you have made it a priority. So great ground to cover. And as you all are listening on the um, call today, if you have a resource that has been really solid for your organization that you like to chat about helping the organizational culture be prepared to tackle DEI in earnest. Go ahead and chat that, please. We're going to create a, a resource, a trove of resources out of this dialogue. So once you idea some starting steps, some starting places in your organization, and then you look at is your culture truly prepared to go into DEI work, to deepen it. Uh, you can't talk about the expectation externally when you haven't done the work internally. But once you've understood that, then how then does DEI actually make a difference? What are some metrics to consider when planning intentional DEI strategies for your organization? Jonathan, please tackle that one. Thank you, Christina. I think when we're looking at metrics, and I'm pretty sure most of everybody on this call has heard uh, what gets measured matters, right? What gets measured matters. And a lot of times people get caught up on, well, I don't know what to measure. I don't know where to start. What I suggest to those is, well, what are you measuring every day? What are your everyday metrics? What are the metrics that you utilize to understand if your organization is successful or not? Now, what do you want to do from a diversity, equity, and inclusion standpoint? Met, use those same metrics, but dive a little bit deeper into the diversity dimensions that you are focused on trying to make progress in. So if you are, uh, for example, we are a, I work currently for the Tulsa Regional Chamber. We, we, we are a member, we are a membership organization. So we, uh, one of our metrics of success is how many members do we have? So then what do we have to do? We have to say, well, how many minority members do we have? And then that, that ultimately led us to, are we asking that on the application? We're not, why not? Well, we probably need to, we probably need to change some of our practices so that we can then get that information. Um, one of the things that we talk about a lot in diversity, equity, inclusion work is that we know that we cannot do everything and you will make very little progress and you probably will make you probably will not start if you're trying to do everything pilot those things that you're interested in doing and then figure out what do we need to be able to determine if we are successful but all of those things should align with whatever your organization goals are right now if you find yourself trying to focus on things that don't align with your organizational goals Ultimately, it will feel like an, an extra to do. It'll feel like something, something more stressful. It'll feel like something that will go away within the next six months because, well, hey, we don't have enough resources or we don't have enough time. So make sure whatever those things are that you are trying to understand and learn more about your organization from a diversity, equity, and inclusion standpoint, those things are aligned with your mission, your vision, and your purpose and use those same metrics that you use to align the, to decide through your purpose to, to track your progress in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you, Christine. Thanks for that, Jay. Jonathan. <laughs> and so again, he hit it spot on. So often when we are in um, consultations or conversation related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and perhaps you all have experienced that too, in your organizations, it's a separate initiative. Well, it needs to be embedded, but we can't get there yet because we haven't provided the intentional focus to it. And are we doing enough with DEI? We need to do more, more, more. It's not about doing more. Again, it's about being intentional about embedding and making sure that DEI work, the lens, the practice, the framework is aligned with what your organization values anyway. And so with that, there's a lot of cautions around DEI work. 
And I'd like to ask Rhonda, will you please share what are some of those cautions that organizations need to be mindful of when preparing to perform the work or even when they're in the midst of DEI work? Okay, thank you, Christina. Um, I wanna talk about a couple of cautions actually. Uh, one of the things is to keep in mind is that diversity takes time. It's not a quick fix. And so you need to be prepared for that because as you all know, change is hard anyway, but the hardest thing is to sustain that change. And that's what we're trying to do through the, through the DEI initiative. So just remember that it is a long-term commitment and that you have to be dedicated to it for the long haul. So as you're cre creating initiatives, training programs, just know that it's not a one-time uh, workshop, one-time training. There's gonna be multiple trainings that you'll need to develop and different types of training as well. So keep those things in mind. And as Jonathan mentioned, you need to measure your training. So these are just things to be cautious of as you go through the program. Uh, another thing to remember is don't limit your diversity strategies to just the HR department. Uh, sometimes companies, they just focus on recruitment. And they think that if they just hire the right people, the diverse people, that they've met the, the, uh, the criteria for diversity. And that, that's not true. You need to make sure that the diversity aspect is, is embedded in all aspects of your organization. So whether it's your marketing your department, your operations department, your management, just make sure that it is part of all of your organization and just not recruitment. And then the other thing I just wanna to mention too is, um, you know, there are a lot of DAI programs out there. And so you may be looking at other programs. Um, I would just say, as you look at other programs, uh, to make sure that you use pieces or portions of that program that fits your organization. Because what works in one organization may not work in your organization. So you need to look at the culture. Uh, you need to look at your management. You need to look at your employees and make sure that if you are using another company's uh, program, that it fits yours. So just tailor it to your specific organization. So those are just some, some basic uh, cautions to be aware of as you develop your DEI program. Thank you very much for those very practical steps to be able to look at cautions around this. I am going to, before we go into um, some of our final Empower Advisory Board members comments for today, I'm going to ask that we open up the virtual floor and that we have discussion around some of the things that you all have heard thus far. What are some questions? There's a few in the chat, but what are some questions you all have or what are some thoughts that the, the conversation thus far has uh, struck up for you? Well, my question, I have a question and that is, um, you know, when you hear all of this, you it's like, it all makes sense. But then when you get to the execution, it's really, you know, it's like Christina likes to say the other side of hard is really good. Uh, I'm wondering, I'd like you all to talk about the trust piece, the starting piece of trust and, and where that needs to go and how, and what are some practical ways organizations can build trust internally and externally. Thank you for queuing that up. What are some practical ways organizations can build trust internally or externally? Steve, I'm going to ask if you could ver if you could uh, clarify for me when you say build trust, are you focused? Are you essentially centered on building trust? within the organization or building trust with those outside of the organization? Probably more on outside, like when you're trying to engage. I mean, this whole uh, experiment called Network 
is uh, trying to build trust across sectors uh, where cross sector work will happen. Uh, I think the same thing with minority organizations uh, working to build relationships where you can do meaningful work together. Um, I just like you all's thoughts on how you've either done it or um, uh, what your suggestions are. All right, I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, I think that when you talk about building trust, the first thing you have to do, uh, if you're looking from an external perspective, is what do you have from a trust perspective internally? Uh, if internally your organization does not believe that we are really about the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion, then I don't really care what you try to do outside. If the people on the inside cannot co-sign that your intentions are pure, then I mean, you're, really, you're not gonna go anywhere. And then secondly, I'll say, what do your receipts say? Do your receipts say that we really care? Or do your lack of receipts say, that, oh, this is the flavor of the month, so now we have to try to appear as if we care. And you have to be honest with yourself, with the organization has to be honest with where you are and speak to what you're willing to do through action and planning uh, to make those needed changes. You can't just you can't just have a whole lot of conversations. Those people, that progress that you, that progress that you, that is needed, that progress does not happen based on conversation alone. So I'll, uh, I'll, leave, I'll leave it at that and then I'll allow some of my, uh, some of our other speakers to be able to kind of add what they would like. I would agree with that, um, Jonathan, in terms of being able to um, back up what you're saying or communicating on paper in terms of action. You know, what are some tangible um, things that are happening that you're doing differently as a result of those internal conversations that, that you're having or even that you may be having with external partners as well. And someone put in the comment, um, comments about this idea of deliberative dialogue. Um, and I love that, I love that name. And so just being able to have those dialogues and I love to learn more about what that person is doing, but um, what, what you're doing with those dialogues and then what are some tangible things that happen that uh, come about as a result? Thank you for that, Sean. You mentioned Frank's comment, Frank Spillers. Frank, can you share with us just real briefly about what those deliberative dialogue processes entail? Um, yeah, sure. Thank you very much. And um, Network Kansas, thank you for bringing this uh, um, network together. This is this is really good. And I'm really enjoying it. Uh, yeah, the process of deliberative dialogue is a process that we have used for over 20 years in communities on what we call wicked issues. Those issues that are hard to solve. There's many different ways you can solve it and many different um uh, opinions about it, but also emotions run high. And we've used this across the state for immigration reform. What should you do about immigration? We've done it on healthcare. We've done it on economic development. Um, everything that a community will, will bring about or an organization that will bring about that uh, people have different values about. And the, it, it does take a while, um, but framing the issue of how people can talk about it in three different ways is the important step because it's not an either or, it is let's think about the third way. And as you can think about that third way, then people can find themselves and their voice in each of the um, what we call uh, the, 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 the frames or the processes in Approaches. there. So uh, having, having um, um, three different ways to do that. And I think I, I heard my wife pop in there of, of helping me think. Yeah, think <laughs> Approaches about was the word so. he was after. 
<laughs> and so um, uh, having having that type of process, and it does take a while to to get it set up, to get the issue framed, to get the dialogues going. But uh, the most important part of this is when you do have a dialogue, or even when you have meetings, is set yourself up in a circle without any tables. Don't put any barriers in front of you. And what that does is it opens the conversation and doesn't give people a uh, a barrier in between them that they can hide behind, but it gives them a, the openness of uh, they can talk in a safe way. And it, it does take a moderator, but the moderator isn't there to direct the conversation. The moderator is there to um, just kind of steer the conversation and to let everybody talk awesome. and let the conversation flow not to facilitate it, but let the conversation flow so people can feel comfortable just like they're having a conversation at their kitchen table. And, and that's really that's really important for communities to go. So that that's kind of the quick 3000 foot view. Yeah. Um, we do have it. <laughs> I'm going to put a plug in, but we do have a community training for that. It's called the Engagement Institute. Um, it's it's a process that we have learned out of the Kettering Foundation out of Dayton, Ohio. Uh, that is a foundation that promotes democracy and civility within communities and organizations. That is fantastic. Frank, I'll definitely get with you and your favorite person on this call, and we will <laughs> get a one-pager out for folks. Thank you, Kim, as well. I see David wants to respond um, and push the conversation yeah. forward. Thank yeah, you. yeah. No, uh, Frank, thank you so much about bringing up framing. I think it's very important here that we really have a conversation about framing or asset framing. It's so interesting as economic development practitioners, um, when we talk about communities of color or women or LGBTQ plus um, veterans, et cetera, we label them or reframe them as underserved, marginalized. So I think we need to rethink that. So in our organization, we, purposely and intentionally refer to everyone as a deserving person. Everyone deserves the right to feel that they belong. So when we talk about systems and culture, and we talk about how all these programs that were created hundreds of years ago, or even with these pandemic programs, and we label them specifically underserved or marginalized, I think it's very important that we really shift that conversation because these are deserving communities that deserve to be dignified and to participate fully. And I'll just stop there. I could go on and on, but thank you, Frank, for bringing up the whole thing about um, framing because I think it's a huge issue in our system. Um, and we, as those decision makers, who hold the keys to the kingdom, for many of these practitioners that we're trying to support need to really rethink how we are talking to individuals and ensuring that they feel fully supported. That's right, that's absolutely right. And so again, as you can see, we covered a lot of ground in a little bit of time as it really relates to some practical um, information to either start or go more deeply in your DEI journeys. Um, framing, how we talk about it, creating safe spaces, looking at metrics, understanding what needs to be in your organization in order to do this work. Understanding it's about progress, not perfection, but that you can make impact in it, but you've got to invest. You've got to invest time. You have to invest intention. And you have to invest resources as well. This does not happen on good intentions and well wishes and dreams alone. But it is a worthy effort because of the impact that it can make to your people, your personnel, to your organizational culture, climate, to your outcomes, and ultimately to your impact. And to live a more connected life as an organization is truly about being about community. So we want to thank you all for participating in this and understanding that, yes, even though I hate it, people talk about DEI work is hard. When we get to the other side of hard, there is opportunity to really and truly see that the work cannot just be talked about as it's just hard. It's too dynamic, it's too important for it to just be hard. 
when you get through something, you experience it. And once you experience it, it's not as difficult. It's not as challenging. It's not as scary. There's more fascination, more resolve, more encouragement, more motivation. And that is the other side of DEI. So I invite us all here, I invite us all to the other side of DEI, where we can also not just look at the progress, the, the problems of DEI or the challenges, but also celebrate the progress. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to um, our final Empower Advisory Board members, just sharing a little bit of the hope and the promise and the practicality of progress in DEI with Network Kansas, Thomas and Christy Preston. Yeah, thank you. Um, so um, we've been in my region in Southwest Kansas, we've been working with Ward County and Seward County um, with a Empower uh, Minority Loan Program. And in Ford County, we've been able to um, provide gap financing for three businesses. We have one salon um, expansion, and then we have two retail businesses as well. Um, also in Ford County, we have um, an entrepreneur that is working with SBDC um, for a technical for some technical assistance. And um, then we will be reviewing that application in the very near future. So we have definitely picked up some momentum in Ford County, so it's very exciting. Um, and then in Seward County, um, we are also picking up some momentum there as well. Um, we were able to offer one of our technical assistance programs, um, Ice House in Spanish, um, as well as English. And um, we filled the Spanish class the first time that that was offered. So that was pretty exciting um, and um, the need was there. And so it was great to, to be able to do that. Um, also working on offering technical assistance in the future in other, um, or offering Spanish options in some of our other technical assistance programs as well. So that's a work in progress um, and that's very exciting. Um, Seward County Development Corporation has recently um, hired a uh, Spanish speaking um, community development um, business coordinator and um, she is very, very connected with the community. She is an entrepreneur. She comes from a family of entrepreneurs. Um, her father is a pastor. She has a Christian radio show. Um, so she is extremely um, connected in the liberal area. Um, this is already helping to develop relationships and build trust in that minority uh, business community. So um, this um, has been fantastic. Um, we have also had some really good um, conversations with the Financial Review Board in um, Seward County um, focused around um, removing the banker's hat and looking at these applications in an economic development um, lens rather than the traditional banking lens. These, these are not um, traditional bank applications. So we've had some really good conversations around that. Um, and that being said, tomorrow um, we will be reviewing uh, two new Empower Loan applications in um, Liberal. So we're looking forward to, to uh, learning more about those as well. Thank you, Christy. That is exciting news. And I did um, place in the chat some of the context around the Empower Loan Fund for those who are on the call as well. Thomas, you're up. Yep. Uh, thanks, Christina. And to give a little bit more context, as you can see there, Christina's chats that the Empowers the No Match Loan Fund that has launched in four total areas, the two that Christy were just talking about, and also Sedgwick County and Topeka Shawnee County. Um, as of right now, the portfolio has six approvals um, for, for loans that were dispersed to businesses uh, going back to July of 2021. Uh, for a total of $74,500 dispersed across those six businesses. Um, so there's three approvals in Cedric County and three in Ford so far. Um, and sounds like there's going to be more projects on the way. And also that uh, Eric and Jen are working on rolling out another Empower community here in the next couple of weeks. So that program is expanding as well. That's right. Thank you for that um, 
larger context about the portfolio. And we'll continue to take lessons learned. It's not a statewide program uh, for this loan fund because it's in pilot phase and we need to learn uh, best practices, also tweaks to make before this becomes offered to additional communities, which uh, some of that conversation is already happening. And to share finally, um, as we begin to transition towards our close for this conversation, Steve with Network Kansas started out why this was important this DEI work was important to the organization. I'd like to ask Eric Peterson um, with Network Kansas, the president and chief operating officer to, to bring some remarks as well. Thank you, Christina. And yeah, to quickly fill in a couple of gaps that people may have had in their head when Thomas was talking, uh, the next uh, Empower that we look forward to doing is in Wyandotte County. And Jen Laird, who's been on this call, has, has done an exceptional job of working with the uh, the entrepreneur support organizations up there, and we're really excited about where that might go. Um, as I thought about this, and thank you for the opportunity, Christina, um, as a bit of context, I'm actually, uh, we're, we're making a, uh, an intentional, deliberate decision to try and take the learning that myself and Steve and Imogene were, had the pleasure of doing through the Spark Heartland program sponsored by Kaufman and instilling that throughout the organization. And I am actually going to Kansas City tomorrow to meet with a potential company to uh, provide that training, uh, learning for our organization. And Christina uh, was helping me kind of vet my thoughts before I go up there tomorrow. And, and she pushed back um, appropriately. I, I didn't really want to be pushed back on. I wanted to just coast, but she uh, didn't give me that luxury. And she asked some, some hard questions, and I liked it. And uh, it, it made me think through that I came to this work when we started uh, from a, a, I knew that developing intentional and, uh, actions around DEI was important for this organization, but, but at that point, it was kind of important from a technical standpoint. I felt like we should, we needed to, but I lacked the why, I lacked the relationships, uh, I lacked uh, even the understanding of the social categories or the common terminology that I heard somebody speak about earlier, uh, maybe even the understanding of the, of the full you know, oppression that, that has taken place to give me a holistic knowledge to have the feelings to be able to truly intentionally go about this work. And back to the opening part that Steve talked about, I have gained so much from our advisory board that, that are on this call uh, in tandem with the great training that, that we were able to go through as a, as a uh, benefit of Kaufman uh, to really frame this up going forward. And so uh, it's just been a fantastic journey uh, to watch kind of myself. Everything you guys said is kind of things I would have said had I been smart enough to say them. Uh, so this has been a really good hour and um, I look forward to kind of the future ones of these and then also gaining the board's insight as we try and figure out a way to take that uh, knowledge that the three of us gained and, and distill it throughout uh, all 18, 19 people in our organization. So Christina, thank you for the couple of minutes to talk. Thank you for sharing as you did, Eric. Being able to be vulnerable in this work is a characteristic of those who really wanna innovate and do better in it. Because again, we're not, all not perfect in this work and there's gonna be times that it does challenge us. It does um, trigger us, but ultimately when we are vulnerable enough to ask our organizations and ourselves, what do we really want to accomplish? And how do we really strengthen DEI beyond talking points, but to action, then you see the difference. You see the difference and you get to the other side of hard. So I wanna thank all of our advisory board members. I thank each and every one of you for thinking in terms of DEI, I know that there was a lot that, of seeds that have been planted. There were a lot of resources in the chat as well. And I just wanna say again, it's work that truly does matter. Don't get caught up in the politics behind the vocabulary. Don't get caught up in that. It's people work and our organizations work with people to make great changes in our communities. So with that in mind, I do wanna push forward and just share that this network convening space we're going in person. <laughs> we're going to come together in person. We're going to discuss DEI. We're going to discuss community development. We're going to discuss health. We're going to discuss um, entrepreneurship. 
and we're going to discuss civic engagement. So the Network for Change Conference is coming. It's happening in Wichita, April 1st. We're going to have a pre-conference mixer at Jenny Don Sellers, who is a Network Kansas client, but she is also the first African-American owned woman, a uh, woman-owned urban winery in the state. And uh, she's getting lots of publicity across the region for the work that she's doing. Fortunate for us, she is actually expanding her winery and we get to get a sneak peek during our pre-conference mixer of her expanded space. So that'll be March 31st, but then we will gather uh, April 1st at the, at the Hyatt Regency. And I can't say enough about what's gonna happen. You just have to be there. And so registration is going to open up in the coming week. We'll send you out information on how to register. But this is for, again, those who are in our network convening, those of you all who collaborate and partner across great challenges in our community to activate changes. This is not going to be your typical experience. It is all about activating. It's all about connecting and coming together to, again, boldly solve community challenges. Special thanks, of course, to Network Kansas, the Kansas Health Foundation, and Blue Cross and Blue Shield for being sponsors, title sponsors of this um, effort and this organization coming together. We will have some additional sponsorship opportunities for those who wish to enhance the experience, but I cannot stress enough, this is an experience you won't want to miss. And so stay tuned for details. And thank you all for contributing to this collective space of network where we are activating, bringing resources together to boldly enhance and help our communities. You all, thanks for your time and attention. We'll catch you at the March virtual convening and hopefully at the April in-person convening. You all take care.